If you just look there at uh, Leviticus 18, verse 30, and this is where we get the title of our message. If you just read that last part of the, it's the last verse of uh, Leviticus 18. And it says, Therefore shall ye keep mine ordinance, that ye commit not any one of these abominable customs which were committed before you, and that ye defile not yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. And the title of the message today is, Therefore shall ye keep mine ordinance. And the Lord has talked to us, and he's said, and I'm not going to, we're not preaching specifically on Leviticus 18, but it's a good uh, starting point. Leviticus 18 goes through basically the rules of incest and what, and, and the things that we shouldn't partake in a spiritual, rela I mean a physical relation, I'm sorry, a physical relationship. And it gives you the rules of, you know, mother and father and aunt and uncle and brother and sister and grandfather, you know, basically covers everything from just regular incest to pedophilia to these things and what's interesting for me and the reason that I picked this is I'm going to specifically touch on what happened this week in the state of New York when New York passed the law or signed into law on January 22nd on the anniversary of Roe versus Wade uh, where you can uh, murder a child up to 24 weeks and pass 24 weeks up to the date of birth if they feel that it's medically necessary. Now before we go into all of that what really stood out to me, so it's covering all of this, and then right there in the middle of verse 21, it says, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of God, I am the Lord. And it almost seems like that verse is just kind of thrown in there at random. You know, obviously, if, you're, if this is your first time reading it or you're going through it, but it makes perfect sense that this verse would be there. And the reason that I'm preaching this is because What's really shocking to me is just how quickly, you know, people get on a political bandwagon for something that's going on. And so let me set this up correctly. And what I mean by this is if you turn to Ecclesiastes 1 verse, actually don't turn there, turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy 18. I'm just going to read for you Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9. The Bible says, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. And Leviticus 18 is really just one of those uh, uh, set of rules, and you know, the book of Leviticus gives us all these laws, where it's specifically telling you, hey, don't partake in any of these, these things. In other words, separate yourself from this kind of lifestyle, and then, uh, you know, make sure that the Lord is your God. You know, if we go up, up there, and the, reason, and the reason I pick Ecclesiastes 1 is to tell you, hey, there's nothing new under the sun. And what's interesting to me is, uh, you know, all these individuals, you got the left and the right getting all up in arms either, either way for this law that was passed in New York. And the thing that really get, uh, stood out to me is that we have similar laws here in Texas. You know, I don't know what the shock is when if you read the Bible, you see there in verse 21, and we're going to see numerous verses. I didn't put a lot. Well, I put a lot of verses, but I didn't put all of them where this is not anything new under the sun. You know, for as long as history has been around, for as long as the world has been around, people have been murdering children. And why does, why does the devil murder children? Well, one, they're weak, they're innocent, and it's a, it's a sign of selfishness. It's a sign of destruction. It's a worship of death. I mean, there's many reasons why this is. And then you think, why is this verse thrown in here when it's talking about all this other uh, of this other uh, basically fornicating sin. And the reason is because fornication itself is the cause of a lot of this because fornication is a selfish physical sin that can lead to, you know, if you have fornication and adultery, uh, you know, obviously you're going to hurt families. You might have children out of, out of wedlock. You become selfish, and that's why we have so much abortion or murder in this country. You know, there's a number of issues that can come out of this. And so let's just really start, let's just break this down real quick it be, before we get into all this scripture that I have, what the facts are. You know, the state of New York, and I have it right here. I actually have the, 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 the law itself and what they amended and didn't amend. Basically, the state of New York went ahead and got rid of an old law. They amended a law that they had on the books. And the reason that they did is, that it says here, an act to amend the public health law in relation to enacting the Reproductive Health Act and revising existing provisions of law regarding to abortion. 
to amend the penal code, the criminal procedure law, the county law, and, the, and they're saying all this, and then we skip down, it says, to repeal certain provisions of the education law relating to the sale of contraceptives and to repeal certain provisions of the penal law relating to abortion. So the state of New York says that they're basically going to get rid of an old law and what they're going to put into place is the changes that they meet necessary. So here it says in section one, legislative intent. The legislature finds that the comprehensive reproductive health care, including contraception, which is basically another form of abortion or murder, and uh, an abortion is a fundamental component of a woman's health, privacy, and equality. Already you know they're lying to you there. It says the New York Constitution and the United States Constitution protect a woman's fundamental rise, right to access safe legal abortions. Courts have repeatedly re reaffirmed this right. And for, Do people even read this stuff? People say, you know, we need to have the Constitution. Constitution does not give you any right to murdering a baby. It says the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit thereof. That means that if you've already conceived life, you should give it the opportunity, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit thereof. But obviously, that's not what the case is going on here. And I'm not going to read all of this to you. I'm just giving you a, a starting point. Because what's interesting, and the point that I'm going to make is that today in America, we have Christianity, we have Baptists, and I'm going to pick on the Baptists today, you know, all throughout this country, because we call ourselves Baptists, that are all up in arms, about, you know, and I mean, and I think it's wicked and I think it's horrible and I definitely think we should speak about it, but we should definitely speak in the right context of it. And I'm not saying that I'm even for this law, period. I'm just, what I'm saying is I'm not for any law that murders babies. But if you look at the context of it, you know, basically they start out with lies and they're giving you uh, reasons why they're going to be selfish. It says abortion is one of the safest medical procedures performed in the United States. The goal of medical regulations should be to improve the quality and availability of health care services. And what's interesting here is, if you really do a study on abortion, it's actually extremely detrimental and unhealthy to the mom, both physically and mentally and emotionally. I mean, it does, it does in incredible amount of destruction and things that they never recover from. Then here's the, the part that everybody's mad about. This is the part that really brought this all to light is uh, each uh, uh, section two of the article says each and every individual becomes pregnant has the fundamental right to choose to carry the pregnancy to term, to give birth to a child or to have abortion pursuant to this article. I'm going to show you in the Bible how that's not true. And then the other part is uh, a healthcare practitioner licensed, certified, or authorized under the Title VIII of the Education Law, acting within his or her lawful scope of practice, may perform an abortion when, according to the practitioner's reasonable and good faith professional judgment based on the facts of the patient's case, the patient is within 24 weeks from the commencement of pregnancy, or there is an absence of fetal viability or the abortion is necessary to protect the patient's life or health. And, you know, if you go to the final law, because this was the, the amendment here, the, the final law, basically what they're outlining is that they're saying that within the first, it's, it's within the first 24 weeks, it's perfectly okay for no reason other than the woman has that right, according to their laws, not God's law. It says, or after 24 weeks, if necessary to preserve the mother's health or if the fetus is inviolable. Now, look. I actually do consulting in the medical industry, and doctors can justify anything if they really wanted to. So if you really wanted to come up with an excuse, and we're already murdering babies, so what's to stop you from just justifying the murder of a baby up to the day of birth, right? But here's where the outrage gets for me, is you know, you got guys like, there's a, a, a pastor of First Baptist Church, Dallas, Robert Jeffers, actually goes by Dr. Robert Jeffers, who's actually the political presidential advisor, I don't know if it's for spiritual matters, to Donald Trump. And this is, you know, Texas is in the Bible Belt. I mean, we're supposed to be this big Christian state and, you know, the Lone Star State and we, we're a republic. And I mean, I, I love Texas history. There's, you know, something to be said about being a Texan. I, didn't, I wasn't born here, but I got here as quickly as I could. But there's also to be said about God's truth, you know, and I wasn't born a Christian, but I got saved as quickly as I could. You know, and that trumps Texas or any other state any day of the week. But if you read the Texas abortion laws, if you just go to the, prov to the provisions here, it says 
destroy the viability of life or child in birth or before, which otherwise would have been born alive, operate in a facility uh, the, of, oh, this is the definition of an illegal abortion. Oh, yeah, the definition of an illegal abortion. Sorry about that. Operating a facility without a license, failure. So all this is whatever. Acts performed after pregnancy with intent to cause termination. Obviously, that's just murder according to the world. Murder for us is just anything from the time of conception. But here's where it says, uh, after 20 weeks of gestation or 22 weeks of calculated from last monthly period. So basically, what they're saying is that in the state of Texas, abortion during the third trimester, uh, the, the third trimester of viable child permissible only if necessary to prevent death or substantial risk of serious impairment to women's physical health. In other words, you can kill a baby up to 22 weeks here in Texas if you have good medical reason. So I don't know why we're acting so, I mean, according to New York law, you can kill a baby up to 24 weeks legally. My question is, you know, where do we draw the line? I mean, is it okay to kill a baby at 22 weeks? Not according to God's law. Is it okay to kill a baby at 10 weeks? Well, not according to God's law. I mean, is it okay to kill a baby after a week? Not according to God's law. And it's not okay to kill a baby at the time of conception. Period. In the story, see, the challenge that I have is not so much that people are in outrage. We should be outraged. But we should be outraged not only with New York, but with this entire country. We should be outraged with the fact that God has a specific judgment on people and on countries for murdering babies. And not just babies, and I'm, you know, today I'm focused on the babies, but for basically breaking God's commandments. Let's go back to Leviticus really quick. Uh, and you, you're still to keep your finger there in Deuteronomy 18, but go back to Leviticus, the first, uh, and the, right there in the beginning it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel. And say unto them, I am the Lord your God. So first thing we have to realize is we have, he is our Lord and our God. And so our rules, our way of life, what we do with our lives, how we educate our children, how we raise our families, what we do on our day-to-day -day basis is ruled by our Lord, our God. It says, after the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. So he's saying, look, don't do what you were doing in Egypt or what they were doing in Egypt. And then, he, and, then he, and then he goes on to say, and after the doings of the land of Canaan, whether I bring you, shall ye not do. So it doesn't matter if you live in Texas or you're moving to New York or you were in New York and now you live in Texas. God says, look, what they're doing in New York, don't do it. And what they're doing in Texas, don't do it. And if you go somewhere else, what they're doing there, don't do it because it's not godly. He says, whether I bring you, shall you not do, neither shall you walk in their ordinances. Ye shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgment, which if any man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord your God. And then he goes into all this list of incestual uh, or incest that can occur and how you shouldn't do it because it's wickedness, it's an abomination. And then of course, some of this is even up to the point of reprobate. This is the, the verses that I highlighted. It says uh, in verse 21, and thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of, God, of thy God, I am the Lord. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is an abomination. It's interesting that it's all in there. Because what, what was another thing that recently came out, and I, I actually didn't even touch on this, this just came out, that, you know, I think it was Parents Magazine had two sodomites on the cover with children. You know, that's child abuse. Those children are growing up in all kinds of confusion, seeing, being exposed to all kinds of wickedness. And it says there, neither shall, and that's an abomination in the eyes of the Lord. It says, neither shall thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith, and I shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. You know, in this country, there's been all kinds of laws. You know, in the, back in the early ages, stages of this country, it was illegal to be a sodomite, punishable by jail time. And then they made a disorder, and now, you know, it's accepted throughout. Right now, we're still at the point where bestiality hasn't been accepted. You know, I know there's people that, that probably practice it. The Bible tells us that. But at some point, the, the nations 
that fall away will be involved in all of this. Not some of it, but all of it. You know, we can, we can maybe make a checklist to be like, oh yeah, our country, you know, check, 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 and then we'd miss some stuff. But if we read there, we just keep reading, it says, defile not yourself in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you, and the land is defiled. Therefore I do visit the iniquity thereupon, and the land itself vomited out her inhabitants. If you look at verse 27, it says, for all, that's the, the one that I, you know, for all have sinned, there it says, for all these abominations though. For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled. So see, we're not there yet. But what happens if we are? It says that God will spew us out. That's why it's important for us. It says, therefore shall ye keep mine ordinance. So what he's saying, look, even though you're going, you came out of a land that had all this, and you're going into a land that's doing all this, you can still keep yourself separate. And you can still toe the line. And so the outrage shouldn't be that New York got there. Look, there's nothing new under the sun. Egypt was already doing it. Canaan uh, was already doing it. And we're going to see numerous uh, scriptures where they've done it in the past. The outrage is that Christianity hasn't, uh, they're, they're not towing the line. They're not holding their ground. They're just kind of playing this in-between game. They don't know if they're here or if they're over there. Look, for us, this congregation, for my family, we stand on God's word. We stand on what he says 100% of the way. And if it's going to interfere with uh, our families, and if it's going to interfere with our jobs, and if it's going to interfere with our friendships, and if it's going to interfere with anything that overrides God's law, well, then we're just going to stick to God's law. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's go there to Deuteronomy uh, uh, 18. And just before that, the other thing that stood out, and I said, well, you know what, we might as well tie it, because this is all an attack on children. If you really look at it, I mean, any time that there's incest, well, what does it do? It's just, you know, children born out of incest already are born with, a, you know, with like a few steps behind. There's issues. There's mental issues they can have, psychological issues, uh, uh, nervous, I mean, just biological issues that they can have. If, if, uh, if you're, uh, like, for example, right there, it has like a grandfather uh, molesting a granddaughter or a grandson. Well, think about the mental destruction that you're doing to that child. Think about the, the, way, the society that you're bringing up uh, around you. If you're committing adultery, I mean, there's all, like, I, I know I'm being repetitive here, but it's real important to do that because the point, I, the, what I'm going to talk about right now is in California, they want to teach kindergartners that there are 15 genders. You know, and I, I mean, there, where's the outrage on that too, right? And California's just gone down this slippery slope. I'm looking at my wife right now because she, she's like, you better say that right. Apparently, I wasn't pronouncing it right. So California's going down this slippery slope. But here's the problem. The world is going to be there no matter what. The challenge is, where are the men and women of God that are going to stand on his fundamentals and not move? They're going to be anchored on Christ. Here is, you know, you've got this Robert Jeffers or whatever, this guy who supposedly runs one of the biggest Baptist churches in America, and he's not towing the line. You know, he, there's no outrage from there. There's no bills to stop all of this. And if, if anything, they're like, you know, let's go war and let's, Trump can do anything, but forget the fundamentals. Look up all the sermons and that. You, it's hard to find a sermon on fornication from Jeffers. You can find one on adultery and it's all watered down. You know, these are the things that are really throwing you. And I mean, the Bible's replete. It's got more stories than I can think of that I could put on paper where this is not an uncommon occurrence, but it's a common occurrence. But here's the thing. During that occurrence, there is a group of people that are separated and that are sticking to God's word. And that's the point of the message today is don't be outraged when these things happen. It's going to happen. The Bible tells us that. But don't take that, that line where you're just going to be like, well, we're in Texas. We're not, we're not killing babies to the day of birth. Yeah, but we're killing them at 20 weeks. The largest Planned Parenthood in the country is here in Houston, Texas, down 45, right next to U of H. When they came out with those videos a few years back of all this uh, organ baby trading, guess where those videos were coming from? Not from New York. They're coming from Texas. Let's go there to Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. It says, 
it, it, you know, there's nothing new, right? Verse 9, when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt, learn to, uh, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Now, back then they were making them pass through the fire to Molech or other gods. Today, we're making them pass. We're, we're not even letting them be born. We're just killing them before they're born for convenience for, uh, you know, independent life, for a furtherance of the career, for feminism movement, for whatever, so that the masculinity is not toxic, whatever the stupid mantra is of the weak, right? It says, uh, there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that useth divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch. And there's another one where, you know, you throw in this, like, don't make them pass through fire. And then he adds all these other things that don't seem to, to match up. But they really do when you really study the Bible. It says, or a charmer or a consulter, in verse 11, with a familiar spirit or a wizard or a necromancer. For all these that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess hearkened, unto observers of time and unto diviners. Uh, but as for thee, as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee to do so. In other words, it doesn't matter what society is doing. And one of the things we know is we will probably, if it's not our generation, it's probably our kids' generation, or somewhere down the road, someone's going to face some tribulation. You know, we don't adhere to this pre-tribulation lie where we're just going to be raptured out of all the bad stuff because, you know, we're saved by grace and, you know, we've repented of everything and we're good people and we don't do... No, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that while we, and for God commended this love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yet sinners, meaning I know that maybe we're not murdering babies, although it seems like in churches in America today, people turn a blind eye to that, but we're still sinning. So what makes us think that we're just going to escape some chastisement or some judgment? Especially if we have preachers in America that have backslidden and aren't preaching God's truth. Go to 2 Kings 16, verse 1, and then we're going to be in 2 Kings 17. And we're going to go through these pretty quick because, you know, I've still got a couple other things to cover. But um, 2 Kings 16, verse 1 says, In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty years old was Ahaz when he began to reign, and reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God, like David his father, but he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Yea, and he made his son to pass through the fire, according to the abomination of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burned incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. You know, there's going to come a day where that might not be that far-fetched. Where people will get up and say, look, my son's in the audience today, and we're just going to have him pass through a fire and sacrifice to whatever. If I did that right now, it'd be an outrage. It'd be an outrage to even those who agree with this New York law. But yet somehow we're okay with murdering a baby in the womb. Somehow we're okay with uh, just turning a blind eye as long as it's not in our state, as long as it's not in our country, as long as it's not in my backyard, as long as I don't have to see it or hear it or smell it or taste it, it's okay. Because that's really the reality. You know, people get offended so quickly. If I were to get on Facebook today and I put a picture of an aborted or mutilated baby, people would be all outraged. You shouldn't be posting stuff like that. You shouldn't put pictures like that. Facebook would probably pull it down. But in the same post, if I were to go on there and just post pictures of, you know, half-naked women doing some kind of abominable thing, then that'd be okay. You know, we've got it all backwards because we're not in God's Word anymore. But what did God say? It was the title, Therefore shall ye keep mine ordinance. Mine ordinance. His ordinance, not what we think is right. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, right? But it's not the right way. Let's go to 2 Kings 17, verse 13. It says, Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye 
from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I command your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets, notwithstanding that they would not hear, but hardened their necks. See, this message is not to the world. The world's going to do what the world does. This message is to those who claim the name of Christ. It says, like the neck of their fathers, they did not believe on the Lord their God. What do we say? You've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Call upon the name of the Lord. Look, they did not believe on the Lord their God, and they rejected his statues and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies, which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them, uh, Brought about them concerning whom the Lord hath charged them that they should not do like them. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and used divination and enchantment and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. See, today in America, this week, you're going to hear all these uh, right-to-life sermons by Baptists. I, I went to a Baptist church when I first got saved, an old IFB church. And every January 20, around that time, <clears throat> they, um, they preached a sermon on right-to-life. Hey, the Bible speaks of that. We should definitely preach against the murdering of babies. But we shouldn't just be so uh, accepting of the fact that the laws allow for babies to be murdered at any point, you know, because it's the law. Look, we should be all or nothing for Christ. The problem isn't that, that, uh, that people are preaching this. The problem is that people are preaching this, and at the same time, they're going to, going to the uh, voting booth, and they're voting straight-ticket Republicans. Because, you know, if you're a Baptist, then you're a Fox News Baptist, then you're going to vote for Trump. Look, I mean, nothing against, well, no, something against Trump. Trump is not saved by grace. Trump doesn't stand on God's laurels. He doesn't stand on God's word. As a matter of fact, I find it interesting. I'm going to read the next verses. Go to 2 Kings 21.1. I find it interesting that there's a correlation between Trump is our president and he's from New York. And this law was passed in New York. I just think it's interesting that that works that way because if we read 2 Kings 21, just let's, let's just stay there. It says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign and reigned 50 and fi uh, five years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hephaziah. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed and he reared up the altars for Baal and made a grove and did Ahab and made a grove as Ahab as did Ahab king of Israel and worshiped all the host of heaven and served them and built altars in the house of the Lord of which the Lord said in Jerusalem I will put my name and he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord and he made his son passed through the fire and observed times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set a graven image of the grove that he had made in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in, the, and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. Neither will I make the feet of Israel to move any more out of the land which I gave their fathers, only if they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But they hearkened not, and Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. Remember, when we started this in, in Leviticus, he's setting them into the land of Canaan. He says, don't do that. And Manasseh says, oh no, not only are we going to do that, we're going to do worse than that. And the reason I point this out is because you know, we're all gun-ho, Republicans, we're coming up on the political season, Trump. Trump comes out of New York, and he seduced these other states and these other people to do worse than we've done before in the past. I mean, Roe versus Wade was just like this, this big deal, and it's just been getting worse and worse. Every state has enacted, uh, you know, just some 
some light form of murder. Look, murder is murder. There's no uh, the lesser of two evils. Look, if you kill a baby a day after it's been conceived, or you kill it at 24 weeks, you're still killing a baby. Look, if you kill a baby at two years old, it's the same as if you're killing a baby in the womb. It's the exact same thing. There's no difference. Why are Christians, why are Baptists, why are people that are claiming the name of Christ saying that it's okay? You know, and then they'll get up there and preach to you like a Romans 13 saying, look, we need to follow every law. Look, if a law, I'm all for following laws. We have to follow laws according to the Bible. But we don't have to follow laws that contradict God's law. If God says not to do it, and it's that important to Him, then we shouldn't do it. Even if it's to the point where we would be jailed or lose our life, or even worse. Well, I mean, losing your life is probably the worst, because at the best, you're going to heaven, but it's the worst here on earth. I mean, but to the point of losing your life. Look, go to Ezekiel 23, and then we're going to be in Matthew. And the reason I just chose Matthew is just so you don't, don't think I'm just picking Old Testament for those that, uh, that are like, oh, well, you're just picking, you know, it's all just in the New Testament. But uh, Ezekiel 23, the same thing. 23 verse 37 says that they have committed adultery and blood is in their hand. And with, the, uh, with their idols have they committed adultery and have also caused their sons whom they bear unto me to pass for them through the fire to devour them. Moreover, this they have done unto me. They have defiled my sanctuary in the same day and have profaned my Sabbaths. For when they had slain their children to their idols, then they came the same day into my sanctuary to profane it. And lo, thus they have done in the midst of my house. Look, this is what's going on in America today. We'll go and we'll cry outrage at a law like one in New York, like this week. And, you know, next week it'll be something else. And then this Sunday they'll fill the pews. And next Sunday they'll fill the pews and give their tithes and say their prayers, you know, and show up and in their Sunday's best and, and claim conservatism and morality to the core. But, in the same, but then they walk out and then they go back to the same thing and then they'll let their eyes watch whatever the TV tells them and they'll engage in murder and they'll engage in adultery and they'll engage in wickedness and they'll engage in homosexuality and they'll get, engage in all kinds of sin. But then in the same day, they'll go and do that. And you know what? These big churches, I guarantee you there's people that get abortions that week. Maybe even the night before. You know, because they're open on Saturdays, I'm pretty sure. There's abortion clinics or murder clinics open, you know, on the weekend. And then the next day, they recover, and then they just go to church and thank God for the great U.S. of A. You know, uh, they go in there and they're like, praise the Lord. You know, Jesus is the way, life, health, and prosperity, as long as it doesn't inconvenience my life. As long as I can still watch my Super Bowls and I can still watch my American Idols and do all those things. And what is he saying here? He says, look, in the same day, then they came the same day into my sanctuary to profane it. And lo, thus they have done in the midst of my house. Go to Matthew 2, verse 16. It says, then Herod, actually, if you want, just go to uh, 1 Corinthians 6. I'll just read Matthew 2 for you. It's just a couple of verses just to point out. This is nothing new, and actually, at, at some points in history, it's been worse. And uh, when, when Jesus was born, it was a lot worse. It says there in Matthew 2, 16, it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coast thereof, coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of that wise man. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. See, the point I'm trying to make here is that the Bible teaches us that we have to slowly or as quickly as possible or whatever you need to do, get in the Word and separate yourself. And it, honestly, it should be in haste. It should be quickly. You should run to that battle. But I understand that there's stages in life and people have different walks and they're dealing with different things. But look, the reality is the longer you stay in those sins, especially those that God considers abominable, the longer that, the, the easier that it'll be for society to just accept all of them. 
and says all these abominations, right? In, in uh, Leviticus 18, the easier it'll be for them to do that. And remember, the, God, if you saw this set of verses, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's just a lot, but sometimes these things happen because this is the punishment of the wickedness of the people. And then sometimes it's also the punishment on his people for hardening their hearts, for not hearkening unto the word of the Lord. And we as a society are going out there and singing glory, glory, hallelujah. And, you know, uh, uh, or when the saints come marching in and all these patriotic songs and we get, uh, you know, our state flags and our college alma maters and all this stuff. But, but when it comes to God's word, we won't get on that bandwagon. You know, it's too hard of a saying. It's offensive. But the reality is we need a little, uh, you know, we need a little offense. We need, we need someone to offend us a little bit to get us back on track. There should be a healthy fear of the Lord. Let me tie this with the fornication that's going on in this world. And this is not a sermon on fornication, but you know what? We need to address it. Because incest is fornication. Pedophilia is a form of fornication. You know, adultery is fornication. I mean, there's, there's all this that ties together. When you go to the New Testament, you start to see how it all ties together. Go to 1 Corinthians 6.18, and then we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 7. The Bible says, flee fornication. You know, Leviticus went through all this list of all these things you shouldn't, all this nakedness you shouldn't expose yourself to, or fornication. And it says, and don't let your children pass through the fire. Basically, don't murder your children. Don't hurt your children. Don't, don't abuse your children. Don't cause confusion for your children. It says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not of your own? For ye are bought with a the prize. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. See, there's no message. You've got to find the heart preachers, you know, I guess at some point, some people took this uh, dividing the word of, uh, of truth or dividing the word of God, rightly dividing the word of God, and, and they misinterpreted it for, you know, it just depends on what kind of preacher you're called to be. And what I mean by that is, you know, here in this country, I mean, here in this state and in this city, we have the largest Planned Parenthood on 45. Just a few miles down, we have uh, Joel Falstein's church. Now, Joel Falstein's not going to preach on fornication. Because, you know, if you look it up and it's verifiable, just, just look, any, uh, look up what he believes. You know, he was only called to preach the good stuff. Well, apparently, so are every big Baptist uh, preacher in America. You know, if they have a big congregation and if they're voting Republican and if they're Fox News Baptist, well, they've only been called to preach the good stuff. They'll preach on adultery, but not fornication. And you say, well, what's the difference? Well, you know, adultery is just one form of messing up that relationship. But fornication, it covers a multitude of sins, right? Go to 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. It says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every, let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render, render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife had not power of her own body. See, if you had a biblical view of marriage, then you wouldn't murder your baby. And then the other thing is it puts also the leadership on the man. The man would say, look, you're not going to murder that baby. Because I've run into situations in my life where I've known uh, young ladies that have wanted to uh, murder their babies. And then the husbands would be frustrated. They're like, look, she won't let me make that decision. Look, you have to be man enough to stop your wife or uh, that person that you uh, were with out of wedlock from murdering that baby. That's not a consequence. You know, God creating life is not a con like a negative consequence. There's something good that's going to come out of it if you see it all the way through. But most people don't want that inconvenience. It says, so going back to all this paperwork on the law where it says that they have the right to choose, the Bible says no. It says the wife hath not power of her own body. See, she doesn't have her own choice. It says, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. See, if husbands weren't, uh, and I don't, I don't use that word, uh, but just for those that 
that uh, that's the common term. If husbands weren't cheating, but the reality is if husbands weren't fornicating and committing adultery, then they wouldn't be having children out of wedlock. And they wouldn't be sprouting up more than one family and hurting all these children and then maybe agreeing with murdering a baby in the womb so that it's not inconvenient, so it doesn't be smirch in name, so that it doesn't cause any, uh, any sleepless nights for you. Look, the first thing, don't, don't fornicate. Period. End of story. But the challenge is that people don't want to be in the Bible. They don't want to follow God's ordinance. It says, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.1, go to Psalm 21 while, while I read 1 Thessalonians 4.1. It says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more, that ye, uh, for ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, even your san san sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. And fornication seems to be a problem in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And it's not a problem that is just uh, once and done. It's a problem that carries, uh, basically it's a lifetime of, of challenges. And the people that are most affected by this type of sin are the children. You know, it's an attack on children for all the reasons that I've mentioned and the reasons that I'll probably mention here in the, in the next few minutes. But go to Psalm 21, verse 8. You know, we, you tie it all together because the outrage is not that they're murdering babies. That's just the effect. The cause is that we're not following God's word. See, you got liberal states. And I don't mean that's kind of a, a, a dumb statement because I, I think that if you were to look at every state, it, it has a lot of liberality compared to God's word. But... For the sake of argument, obviously New York is a lot more liberal than maybe a state like Texas. But you've got states like that where they allow everything goes. You know, they have all these wicked parades. They have all this inclusiveness of religions and of faiths and of confusion and of science and of lifestyles. And then what do they think the, the end result is going to be? It all ends in the same thing. It ends in destruction. It ends in doom. You know, we were out there soul winning a day. And it, it, it really saddened me. And this is the, the, the effect of fornication. Because when you tell people that they're like animals, you know, animals, if you ever see a dog on the street, they'll hump anything. You know, they'll just, uh, it doesn't even have to be an animate object. You know, it just, they'll do, that's just the way they are. Because they're animals. And we were, there was two kids on the side of the road right before we were leaving. I was walking up to them. You know, I get real excited when I see anybody under the age of 15 because I almost think it's a, it's, a, it's a slam dunk salvation. Well, apparently I'm wrong because I walked up to these kids. They couldn't have been more than 15 years old. Uh, uh, right, Brother James? I mean, I don't think they were more than 15 years old. They were probably between 12 and 13, probably 12 and 15 years old. And I went up to them and I'm like, hey, you know, we're Spring Crest Baptist Church, you know, uh, and they're right away, both of them, they're like, oh, no, we're atheists. I said, excuse me, you said you're atheist? I said, so you, you know, it just kind of shocked me that they were so quick to respond, because usually you get that response from someone who's been jaded and supposedly hates God, and, you know, you don't understand their life or whatever, but never from really young children. And I'm like, you, you're atheist, like, you don't believe in God? They're like, yeah, that's right, we don't believe in God. I was like, wow, pretty confident. I said, well, can I ask you a reason why you don't believe in God? They're like, well, we just don't. So I said, so then, you know, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? They're like, well, we don't believe in God, so we don't believe in heaven or hell. I mean, they had their answers like pat. They were ready to roll. It's like, oh, okay, well, you know, I just kind of wanted to work with them. I said, look, just how about you give me the benefit of the doubt that if a God exists, you know, and if, we're, if I'm right, you could end up in hell. They're like, yeah, but I could give you the benefit of the doubt that why don't you believe that there is no God? I was like, man, these guys are on it. Like, how sad. And so I just, you know, I didn't even argue them, but I talked to them a little bit. I was really blunt and direct. And I said, well, you know, it's hard to be an atheist because I said, why do you think you're an atheist? I was like, well, we believe in evolution. I don't remember how we got into it. And this kid, he starts quoting to me about how there's microbiology and, you know, it was a big ball of fire. And then these microorganisms became bigger organisms. That's how we got everything and blah, 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 blah. Because I, th oh, that's right. I had mentioned how, you know, it's stupid to believe that something came from nothing because, you know, if you take a seed, who put the information in the seed so that a tree could be born, right? Or who put the information in, in our seed so that we could be humans or anything? You know, like uh, uh, the Creator, God, God Almighty, Jesus Christ, because I don't want to give you this ambiguous Creator like the world does. Well, anyways, this kid's arguing with me, and at the end of it all, 
I said, look, all I'm going to leave you with is God in the beginning created heaven and earth. I know for a fact that God tells me where something came from. I said, and it's really interesting that you believe that something came from nothing. And I said, the other thing that's really interesting to me is that you guys would believe something like that when there's no proof. Nobody was there in the beginning. You know, there's no scientific proof for evolution. There's no, there's no like half mutated like salamander that's turning into a bird or a bird that's turning into a monkey and a monkey that's turning into a human. And he, he argued with me a little bit. Not, it wasn't confrontational. They were real calm. That was the sad part, how calm and collected they were about the whole thing. And they said, look, we're just atheists. We don't believe in God, but thanks for stopping by. But the reality is that it starts here. You know, these children go to these public fool systems where these women go and teach because they have careers. And guess what kind of life they're living? You know, one of the biggest problems in America today is that you have young female teachers that are fornicating with students. You know, because they're not at home raising their children decently and in order. They're not submissive to a husband. They're not submissive to a congregation or a pastor in a church because they think they have the right to do whatever they want. You know, you say, wow, that, that feels like it's a far-fetched. No, it's not. Because God would have not put these verses in between all these abominations if it was a far-fetched. Either God's right or what are we doing up here at all? Go to, uh, go to Psalm 21. But here's the, the conclusion of this whole thing. The big thing that we've got to focus on, and before I go to the conclusion, and just so we could close out, we, we don't have that much longer, is, you know, the world is not going to change. And the, these things, we're headed down that road, right? You know, I printed uh, just a copy today of, of you know, because that's where Fox News Baptists go. If they can't get their news from Fox News Baptists, they go to Drudge Report. And I printed here the headlines, right? Some guy's going to run for uh, president as independent, Venezuela, the U.S. Is, is getting themselves involved in things they're not supposed to. You know, there's guys here that uh, uh, are talking about flesh-eating bacteria. Uh, they're talking about this Trump and Ocasio-Cortez use the same tricks to win politics. Uh, I guess IRS is not going to refund you money like it used to. Uh, Chinese cars are still cheap, but they're no longer ugly. Uh, CBD goes mainstream as bars, coffee shops, and weed. I add weed to menus, so now we're promoting uh, the use of drugs. Scientists working on a pill for loneliness, you know, because you shouldn't feel lonely. Poor little you. Just go to, you know, if you have Jesus in your life, you'll never feel lonely. Why am I going through all this list? Because th there's any, you can pick outrage any day of the week. They give you a menu here. They give you a menu of everything, so they say, look, you want to be outraged, you want to pick a morality, you want to pick a workspace salvation, here you go. But they won't get into the Word of God. You know, they won't, they won't open their Bible in the morning and read, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. So that a 13-year-old won't be an atheist. Or they won't read Leviticus 18 and say, look, these things are an abomination, so you don't go and, and support a pedophile or a sodomite or incest or whatever. But what I want to leave you with is that God's still in control why did I pick on the children? Because at the end of the day, God tells us we're his children. And he talks to us as his little children. And so it's our goal not only to protect ourselves from the world and keep ourselves separate and in God's word, but it's our goal and our duty and our responsibility to raise up the next generation the same way. Look, what's done is done. I'm 39 years old next month or next week, I, sometime in the next few days or something. And... What I've done in the past, I can't unchange, but I can change the future. You know, I can go soul winning a little bit more. I can stay out a little bit longer. I can read my Bible a little bit more. I can preach to my children about the fear of God and the consequences of fornication and the consequences of not listening to God's word. You know, and, and I can show them Psalms 21.8 and say, Thy hand shall find out all thy enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. Their fruit shall thou destroy from the earth, and their seed from among the children of men. See, sometimes this occurs because that's God's judgment on this world. Now, I'm not going to play God and tell you that everything that's happening is God's judgment, but there's some things that are, possible, that are pretty clear that are God's judgment, not only on the world, but even on us for backsliding. Verse 11 says, For they intended evil against thee, they imagined a mischievous device, 
which they are not able to perform. Therefore shalt thou make them turn their back, when thou shalt make ready thine arrows upon thy string against the face of them. Be thou exalted, Lord, in thine, strength, in thine own strength, so we will sing and praise thy power. Who's still in control? God's still in control. See, the outrage shouldn't be with what's going on. That's in here. That's how the end times is going to come about. That's how tribulation has to be. It's going to be worse then than it was in the past. But for us, we have, to stay, we have to stay anchored on God's word, or as it's been the theme for probably this month for a lot of people who stay within the circle of pe preachers that, that we follow, we have to be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Go to Psalm 115, verse 13, just a couple of pages over. It says, He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more. And look, he doesn't say you and your possible children or the ones that you work out. It says you and your children. It says the Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. That means that God's making an assumptive statement here. He says, look, you're going to have children because what was the first commandment? Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. See, anything that goes against God's word uh, is antichrist. And it's something that we shouldn't stand on. The outrage should be that we're not following God's word because it doesn't matter. These people are like, oh, you know, all this abortion and murdering in New York. Yeah, but in churches they promote, uh, you know, contraceptives and birth control and you shouldn't, you know, uh, women having careers and, you know, the mom and the dad uh, dual income so that they can survive and do the things that they do because it's okay, you know, to have the nice things in life. Let's keep reading there in verse 15. It says, Ye are blessed of the Lord, which made heaven and earth. The heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence, but we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. And then let's just go to a couple of verses there. Go to Matthew 19, and then we're going to be in 1 John 2, 3, and 5, where God specifically tells us, not only how we should treat children, but that we are His children. Matthew 19. Actually, just turn to 1 John 2, and I'll read Matthew 19 for you. And uh, it says there, Matthew 19 says, Then were there bought, well, that means says, Then were there brought unto Him little children, that He should put His hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer, little children, and forbid them not to come unto Me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid hands on them and departed thence. If you go to 1 John 2, verse 1, it says, My little children, speaking to us, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Baptists that are moral and outraged at laws, even though we are basically deceiving ourselves when we promote the same thing, just in a different flavor. But whoso keepeth this word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought also ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. Verse 5 said, but whoso keepeth his word. Whoso keepeth his word. That means every word that's out of the King James Bible for the English-speaking people. First John 3, 7, just turn a few pages over. It says, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for a seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. See, if we're the children of God, there's the children of the devil, right? It says, Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. See, another thing that you see amongst, uh, you know, professing Christians is a lot of discord. I mean, I, I've had more conversations in the last few weeks with people. I'm trying to, you know, set up soul winning uh, events 
uh, through the different places that I travel. And, and uh, by the way, the conversations with these individuals aren't negative. These are people who want to uh, come on board. But some of them want to include their churches or other fellow believers. And the conversations are like, well, they want to get to know you. I'm like, hey, that's not a challenge. I mean, have them give me a call. I'll, I'll, I'll work with anybody that believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. But, and I, but I tell them, here's the challenge. If you believe, for example, we believe a couple of doctrines. I, you know, I believe in the reprobate doctrine. We believe in the post-trib. We, we are anti-sodomites and pedophiles and inclusiveness. And, you know, we're family integrated. These things, these are just a couple of things that stand out. There's churches that aren't like that. They believe in the pre-trib and having nurseries and, you know, let everybody come in and maybe, you know, those individuals can get saved. They won't go with me so winning because they think, you know, I'm a bad guy. I'll go so winning with them, you know, and, and put that to the side for a second. And hopefully we can have an honest conversation about that with the Bible. But the thing that I, I guess the point I, I, I've been making this week is, look, the, the more correct you get on the word, the further right you go. And what I mean by right is biblical right. The more you're willing to love another brother and work with them so that we can go out there and do more for the Lord. But when we start falling away, when we deceive ourselves, this is little children, let no man deceive you. When we let other people deceive, then there's no love for the brother. There's no love to keep the commandments. And we end up falling on the devil's team, even if we didn't want to. Let's go to 1 John 5, 1, and we'll close out. It says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him, that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God cometh of the world, overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? And see, it's not just like we tell people, it's not just enough to believe. There's people that believe Jesus, they think he was a prophet, they believe Jesus existed. The Jews know and believe that Jesus existed, but it's to put our faith and trust in him. And when we do that, we also put our faith and trust in his word and everything that he tells us to do. And so the outrage is not that the world's headed down a, 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 an evil, slippery slope. The outrage is that those that have believed on the Lord Jesus are headed down that slope too because they're not getting into the Word of God and they're not anchoring themselves on the truth. So my, my message to you today is that we should therefore show you keep mine ordinance. See, my goal for you in 2019 is not so much that, you know, you go out there and make a ton of money or reach some new plateau in your career. I mean, if you do all those things, great, but my goal is that you keep his ordinances and that you read God's word more, and that you go to church more often, and that you go out soul winning more often, that you do the work, so that when, when the world tells you, oh, look, this is what you need to be outraged about. This is the news of the week. You're like, nope. The news of the week is that today we're going to do the main thing, which is staying on God's word, and that we're going to educate our children, and we're going to educate our families and our friends and our congregation and our, the people that we're discipling to follow his commandments and to love our brethren, to love them and help them grow in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today and the opportunity to be here and uh, preach a message like this. And Lord, uh, I pray that it, that it was your word that stood out and, and that the message made sense, Lord. And, and, and the idea behind the message is not just to speak about the murder of babies. I mean, it's, that's... That's of uh, huge importance. But even more important, Lord, is if we're grounded in your word, Lord, and if we're keeping your ordinances, there wouldn't even be a talk of murdering babies. Because men would leave their homes and make themselves responsible for their actions. Men would be faithful to their wives. Men would raise up their, their families uh, and their children, and they wouldn't uh, use birth control and stop their wives from having more children and from being fruitful and from multiplying and from per having them pursue another career so that they can have an extra car or a bigger home or any of those things, Lord. So, Lord, it's just uh, my goal that your word came through today and that uh, we would be more diligent and more focused 
and, and more uh, honest with ourselves and, and take a deep look inside and say, look, we need to just keep your ordinances stronger and be more separate and more holy unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.